as soon as Peg gets back in here, we will begin for today. I want to thank all of you for coming uh, and for those who are viewing or recording this so that uh, students in the future will be able to look and you can look on the student page and you will find the past recordings and we hope to have all 21 uh, classes uh, books to be able to be re recorded here. We may split a couple of them such as book 10 which is two volumes and, and some of the others there are two volumes just depending on that since there's so much content uh, we may end up uh, splitting those so it may end up being more than 21 recordings. But anyway that's the plan so for the next two and a half years here we are and going through. So again we appreciate all of you coming out um, we will be doing the opening ceremony here in a minute. We're also going to, I'm going to follow up just a little bit on some ideas of book two, and then we'll get into uh, book three, talking about how this life journey that is represented in book three really, really moves us forward. This book in itself has no distractions. It is only 90 some pages, but it is packed. I read it through in a few hours and have read it through multiple times. And it's one of those that when I did book three, I thought, okay, now nah, there's not as much here. And so I did it and I did the questions and then I ended up having to wait, you know, the 30 days. And that was really an error. I, I didn't until I got near the end of the course realize the impact that this course has and the power that the that book three is really incorporates. And I'm, I'm gonna refer to several things that will be picked up again in, in book nine when we talk about mental alchemy, but this is just one of the aspects and one of the important features. Uh, after we do that, we will have the closing ceremony and then questions and discussion. So that's gonna be our agenda for today. Peg, are you back? No Peg yet. Yes, I just need to unmute. Oh, okay. And so could you uh, lead us please in the opening ceremony? Yes. Thank you. Eternal brothers and sisters, we are now about to open a Church of Light meeting in the customary manner. And in so doing, let us consider seriously the purpose for which we are here gathered together. The purpose which, since the dawn of human intelligence, has drawn true brothers and sisters of the light into holy convocation. The purpose which, during all ages, has attracted the spiritual efflorescence of every epoch together at selected meeting places. The purpose which has ever impelled the noblest and most exalted souls of earth to band together for a common effort. That purpose is to study nature's laws, to unfold the divine attributes of the soul, to secure conscious immortality, and to attain the royal grandeur that surely surrounds the true perfected human. As has been the customs for eons past, let us arise and face the east, from whence each day the sun first sheds its all illuminating rays upon the children of the earth. And bear in mind that even as all energy, light and warmth upon the earth are derived from the solar father, so in truth all life, light and love known to man are derived from God, the spiritual father, whose all providing care was symbolized in the minds of our ancient brethren by the orb of day. Let us now make the symbol of the religion of the stars. We stand to indicate active volition with right hand raised to heaven in aspiration to, to divine knowledge and power. And the left hand extended to earth as a pledge that such knowledge and power will be used only in spirit and in truth for the benefit of humanity. You may lower your hand and I will pronounce the invocation. O thou eternal spirit, in whom we live, move, breathe, and have our being. Consecrate this meeting to the cause of truth and righteousness. As brothers and sisters of the light, we seek knowledge at the shrine of goodness. 
Therefore, by virtue of our unselfishness and sincerity and desiring to assist in thy works, we ask the help of the legions of light and their protection from all forces of darkness. So shall it be. So shall it be. Meg, thank you very much. As, as president of our organization, are there any announcements or anything that you wish to share? Uh, not at this time. And are you going to start the recording, Alan? I already have. Okay. So it's all good. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Let's, and we touched on book two last week. And I, one thing that I do when I teach classes at, at university is I, I ask it right at first some of these questions to consider. Now, given the, the number of participants we have in our time, we won't go through and uh, I won't call for individuals to share, but I really want you to consider these at, in moments of meditation and as you prepare yourself in the future for this work and, and other great works. La book two was really about journey. So what journey are you on? How is that being defined in your life? And I really want you to ask the question because it is asking in book three as well, and you'll see this repeated in various forms as what is it to live a good life? We're gonna answer part of that question today, but it's a consideration from book two. Uh, again, uh, consideration in book two and, and moving forward is how is seeking balance a part of this experience of a good life and the journey you're on? I think you'll find that to be very personal and, and something that while there may be a theme will change as you go through. And then we, we talked extensively about the gold and silver keys, unlocking the inner and outer doors of the chamber represented by King Solomon's temple. That symbolism is just the symbolism of whatever is sacred in your life and the journey that you are progressing through that sacredness and that sacred time. What elements represent not just the gold key of astrology and the silver key of the tarot, but what, what important milestones, what important aspects have also helped along the way? And how has that been influenced by your understanding of the gold and silver keys of, of astrology and of um, the tarot? And the, the ultimate question, are you now ready to begin that next step? Last week, we talked about how as you progress through that sec the second book, you now no longer have the excuse of ignorance. Uh, after the end of book three, you now have no longer the, the excuse of now, what can I do to help change this situation? Personally, uh, I have to be reminded um, more than once on a regular basis that I have the, the power and the authority to alter the influences in my life for the good. I am not a victim. I am not one that has to be overrun by all of these things that are happening. I can choose to be and, and to influence those effects of my life. So those are just some items to consider in book two and, and to consider as we do book three. Now, book three is one of the shortest books in the series. It's only 90 some pages, less than 100 pages. And the themes are centered around seeking balance and active personal interventions, not passive. This is where we step forward and we act on the information that we gain. We, because of that, this deepens our level of personal responsibility. Excuses are, are no longer acceptable. And it takes where we have knowledge and we start applying it to experience to gain wisdom. And that moves us from knowing to doing. Uh, one thing that these volumes represent is active engagement, not just passive observation. And you're going to be challenged. I, I certainly was challenged and I, I know most people who have gone through this material, one of their themes is they will say, I was challenged by these materials. I was 
sometimes disturbed by these materials. And because of that, I had to take action. So just briefly, I would like to have one, one open discussion. And that is because these books were written at certain periods of time, the events of that time, I believe, had a strong impact on their content. So this, these, this volume was really written around 1931 and a through 19, I believe, 33. What was going on in the world? in the early 1930s. Brett, what do you think? What, do you remember what was happening in the world in 1930s? Brett, are you, can you hear me? Okay. Anyone he may want to be muted. Um, Brett might be muted. Ask yeah, he him was. Oh. Yeah. Brett, can you unmute? Can you unmute, Brett? Am I muted right now? Oh, you're fine now. Oh, well, okay. What was happening in the world in the 1930s, early 1930s? Uh, the Great Depression. Great Depression. Any other events that you can recall? Uh, not at this time. Okay. You had the rise of fascism. Yep. Both in Spain, in Germany, even here in the United States. The, um, the, the rise of authoritarian governments throughout Europe and America was profound. And the United States, depending on the, which historian you, you, you want to believe, was on the balance of moving more to an authoritarian government. It didn't. And it was led away from that. We also had the Dust Bowl. Uh, for those who remember reading The Grapes of Wrath, uh, this is the time frame. So huge, huge environmental issues and Dust Bowl and deprivation that, that was brought on by, by the results of not only the depression, but just the weather and the situation itself. So lots of things occurred that I think are reflected within these materials and something you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind. They are also, if you will, these same types of situations seem to be arising again. Now, I, I encourage you to also look and to maintain an awareness of what's happening within the astral bodies. In uh, 2019, we, uh, we have Uranus that entered into Taurus, which has had a, it's on an 84 year cycle and has had a, a, pr a profound effect when you look at the uh, US chart. Now, again, just because you may have a astral body moving into certain locations may or may not have significance. You have to look at the natal and the progress chart. We'll learn more about that as, as we progress on, particularly into book 10. But lots of things are happening right now that also there were other significant uh, astrological events happening in the 1930s. But right now, for instance, um, our summer solstice occurs on the 21st, excuse me, our, our winter solstice. Also, we have a once every 600 year conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter taking place on the 21st. Uh, we had a solar eclipse occur in South America and in Sagittarius. Uh, we, we have all kinds of cosmic events occurring, such as uh, last year, the atmosphere of Pluto was stripped away by a huge electromagnetic event. And then this last week, it was reported that Neptune has or is experiencing right now dramatic electromagnetic influences that are reversing and possibly flipping its polar axis. Lots of influences and things are occurring that again may be alive. Yeah, it, it, it's just a, it's, you know, the old Chinese curse, you may, you live in interesting times. We certainly do. And we often will feel helpless of saying, well, what can I do? given all of these dynamic influences that are occurring, what can I do? That is the, the theme of book three. 
is what can you do? When we look at spiritual alchemy, and I'm going to refer a lot to the books today, just because, again, it is so packed, is it's a process of purification, fluxing, and subjugation to fire. So the, the first introduction to the importance of the vibratory rate or that reverberatory furnace of emotions, of attachment of strong emotions internally is going to be made here. That's going to be carried through in various volumes of the book. Uh, we also have the symbolism that's represented by a, a, both metals and if you will, ma common materials. The physical body on page 14 is represented by salt. The spirit is represented by sulfur and the soul is represented by mercury. Now, these are elements that are commonly found. They are also significant elements within most religious traditions. Um, who was it that was turned into a pillar of salt? Yep. Within the the Bible. Lot's wife. Lot's, Lot's wife. wife. Lot's wife. And, yeah, and why why was she turned into a period of into a pillar of salt? She looked back. Yeah. She she violated the the, the law and the instructions that were given to her. Um, why what's the representation of sulfur in most uh, spiritualization? <laughs> Yeah, sulfur represents often fire and brimstone in some traditions, or if you will, um, a intense heat. And then the souls represented by mercury, uh, or quicksilver, as is often referred to. And we're going to talk extensively about, uh, as we go through the various celestial bodies and the metals that are associated with them, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, mercury. Now, the chief end of all alchemists, in which is found on page 16, is symbolically represented by three processes and three events. And these are symbolic in nature, moving us from the very elemental to achieving the cosmic man. The first is to obtain the philosopher, philosopher's stone, which was the idea anything you touch turns to gold that the ability to take base metals, to take the base of an individual and move toward a more perfect or cosmic man as related in the, in the, in the books. We also find number two is the discovery of the elixir of life. And that's to uncover the essence of living well, the essence of love. We could say it's the pursuit of, of, of total happiness, not just emotional satisfaction. And lastly is, the, is to accomplish the great work. And that is the preparation for our passing to the next, next state of existence. Within most, uh, if you will, most ritualistic organizations, uh, mystery schools, you will find that the focus is not only on application of things that you can do now, but also preparation for what is to come as we pass. Um, I was teaching uh, this last week, I concluded um, this, this term's lectures in the university classes I teach. One of the classes I had was on human development. And the last class was on death and dying. Now, to those that are 18 to 22 years old, death and dying is a concept that is uh, foreign at best or is something that is just totally frightening at the worst. But yet, when you examine the qualities, especially as people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond, look back and reflect. And one of the things they had to write was a biography about someone and, and their development through stages of life, particularly the last. Those who lived life well, those who traveled another path like M. Scott Peck in The Road Less Traveled, those were the people 
that had satisfaction in love in their life. And I believe, I truly have come to believe that this book on spiritual alchemy contains the formula of how to live and accomplish that great work. And hopefully you'll find that too. So let's look at some definitions and look at some assumptions because it's significant. And as I say, I, I have dog-eared, highlighted, bookmarked so much of this. It, it, it gets to the point that it's almost too much, but it's important. And you'll refer back to it when we talk about astral bodies, about what are the characteristics and what are the associated metals. When you look at the sacred tarot, particularly in the way of the cards that we have, there is on every card, especially of the um, uh, main arcane, is that you will see that there is a metal associated. So gold vibrates to the sun. Silver vibrates to the moon. Uh, Mercury has an interesting uh, almost dual aspect, vibrating to the planet Mercury and to the soul within. Copper vibrates to Venus, iron vibrates to Mars, tin vibrates to Jupiter, and, and lead vibrates to Saturn. Now, why only seven? Why aren't we talking about Neptune, Pluto, Uranus? Because they didn't know those planets existed? They, they were not visible to the naked eye. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you look at some of the earlier um, uh, Central Europe or, or Central Middle East countries, uh, particularly the Assyrians and others, they had calculated out that at least Neptune and Uranus existed. And they did that without geometry or advanced mathematics, supposedly. Uh, pretty interesting, but these seven planets are the ones that are considered traditional and ones that can be seen with the naked eye. Uh, the, 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 conju the, the conjunction of um, Saturn and Jupiter, this the 21st, is significant and often it only occurs this close once every 600 years and is often said this was the star that set the Magi uh, out. Well, of course, they didn't know it wasn't a star. It was two planets. But they, again, they couldn't differentiate that because it was so bright. Let me get back over here. So let's look at the various characteristics of these elements. Lead heavy, it's dull, and it's under the domination of Saturn. Now, if you've, if you've ever fished, or if you've ever been involved with, with working with various metals, lead is something that's very malleable. Uh, but with it, it's also used as a weight. So it brings heavy responsibility, prodding labor, and just kind of a sadness that is often overcast. And these are also associated with the plattered Saturn. But like I said, it's extremely malleable. In other words, you can shape it even just with a pair of pliers and sometimes even with your fingers. And I thought it was interesting on page 33 that it's noted for um, a demand of payment with interest but yet also associated with aspects of diplomacy. But it can be in the extreme, uh, lead to extreme selfishness or focus on self to the exclusion of others. It's also interesting to note that it's associated with disease, loss, sorrows, obstacle, poverty restrictions, and all kinds of other areas of these things. It's interesting to look at the U.S. chart right now to the influence of Saturn and the aspects it makes. We will save that discussion for when we talk about mundane astrology and the uh, appropriateness of which U.S. chart and the various things that it leads to. The, the all, as you will learn, all metals uh, are not, uh, especially if they're considered uh, malevolent, are not necessarily all negative. There can be gain through planning. 
uh, with the influence of Saturn. Also, you will have the influence of persistence and intelligence and reflection of thought. And that's noted on page 31. And I wanted to read something on page 32 that I thought was of note, and that's the second paragraph. And let me read that for you for its prominence. Just as Saturn in a birth chart afflicting the luminaries impairs the physical vitality, repetition of sex acts will cause chronic diseases that waste the spiritual tissues as certainly as tuberculosis destroys the body. Every selfish act of life brings battering immortal gold for sodden material lead. For uh, material riches and advantages dishonestly gain way down the soul and impair in its process, even as lead carried about the person hampers physical action. One, one poem that I helped co-author, and I'm not a poet, trust me, and this was based out of a Masonic uh, writing, was the idea of not turning lead into gold, but turning gold into lead. And how many people have I known through the years, and you probably have too, that have had really good things, really good experiences. And then they take something good and turn it into something not good and destructive. So I, I have that second paragraph highlighted, referenced, and dog-eared dog just because on that second paragraph on page 32, is so important about what happens when Saturn is prominent in the chart. 10 is associated with Jupiter and has a very low melting point, very malleable, and offers, interesting enough, resistance to the corrosive action of leads. It brings health, wealth, influence, uh, inspires charity, and really uh, a return for of good for evil, turning the other cheek. And I, I thought the definition that, that he gave on page 33 is of, of importance. And that is, he defines these corrosive avids, acids as envy, and if you will, the actions that lead to remorse, but not the heat of dissipation. It's thought to be, it's thought is about to live and to let live. And that's on page 33. And let me go on, uh, read this quote on page 34, because again, of the significance that it has about 10. Without 10 or Jupiter, the life of man or woman would be stern and severe. There would be little inclination to assist others, little thought for anything save self. There would be no religion and no charitable institutions, no parental kindness and no mercy. Lead demands payments and usury. Iron demands an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But 10, uh, but 10 rise to a higher law that permits it to return good for evil. It is, thought in, it is thought in life is to live and to let live. It aspires to extend the helping hand to all mankind and lift them up through sheer nobility and purpose. When, in, an, in an organization, when you see Jupiter prominent, that is a charitable organization that is intent on, on doing good and helping others. Uh, as I say, resisting that of envy and helping to fend off remorse and sadness is why Jupiter balanced against Saturn is so important. And we're going to talk about how to utilize these things. Iron represents a hard metal and represents Mars. And it's also one of the few metals that can become magnetic making it subject to outside influences. Uh, iron demands an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And it encompasses both construction and destruction. Mars can be and often is harsh. It is abrupt. It can be seen as those aspects that are as much problematic as anything else. 
Yeah, and I the, the, several comments in the chat box, and I'll, we'll we'll come back to them. Uh, but iron is also necess, ne necessary in life because it is a part of the action of determination. So as we're going to see, any one element itself or any one planet of itself, when isolated, becomes extreme. When mixed and balanced, brings positive things to life and the ability to act. Copper conducts heat and electricity represented by Venus. It uh, provides us with compassion, and two commas in compassion, with compassion, uh, affection, refinement of the arts. Page 36, paragraph four. Copper is, no, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. An alchemical combination, also it leads to Perform, to prominent to permanence and a magical ring on an amulet of metal to retain its potentness must not only contain gold and silver, but a small portion of copper. It is the love element which retains the magical force and binds the gold and silver in permanent union, permitting the interaction interaction of magnetic forces between them. The origin, the body retain their life and perform their function only so long as organic copper unites the separate cells that, that compose them and binds new cells to the old to replace those decomposed by iron and disintegrated by rust. Copper acts not only as a binding agent, but as a preservative and a preventer. Uh, for those of you who've ever grown grapes, or had any type of vine, uh, one way that you treat various pestilence is by the use of a copper sulfate because it is considered to be a sanitizing agent. Not only does it bind, but it will repel those harmful influences. Mercury is an unusual uh, metal. Matter of fact, one of the only metals that at room temperature, it's a liquid. It is disturbed by outside influences easily. Uh, of people of my age, uh, remember, you may remember in junior high playing with mercury in class. They didn't realize the toxicity of this metal to the extent that they do now. And if it becomes a gas, it is highly toxic. Uh, you may remember reading in Alice in Wonderland, what was the problem with the Mad Hatter? Mark Doubleday, what was the problem with the Mad Hatter? Honestly, no. I don't remember that ah. specifically about the Hatter. The hat, the the haberdashers, the Hatters, they oh, use that's... mercury. They use mercury as a as a um, binding agent and to help felt hold its form and they subjected themselves to mercury pointing and it, it led yeah. to insanity. Gold, goldsmithing and also gold mining, very highly toxic because they use the mercury to and separate. Arsenic. And they still do in some parts of the world without hardly any protection. Exactly. Them. And that's one of its other elements is mercury can separate precious metals from uh, the base ores. And that can be a constructive act or like he referred to, if it's not properly controlled, it can become very toxic to the environment and to those people around. Silver represents the moon, bright, and it's very susceptible to acids. Now, now what did we say acids were? Doc Cummings, what did we, do you remember what we said acids were? No, I wasn't paying attention. I was oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we talked about acids as being envy and bringing sadness. And it's interesting that when we talk about silver, that also represents nutrition, nourishment, nourishment, home and family, how vulnerable are families to envy and to personal sadness that occurs? And it can become very destructive. And 
silver representing the moon is subject to that. Interestingly enough, it's considered a negative energy and it has to be bound with something else to hold its form. The family without various interactions and without various structure falls apart and it's very vulnerable. And that's why the influence of the moon, when you're looking at it in your chart, as it may, add, especially in the, in the natal and the progressed, can be influenced by aspects to other positive and negative. It's also a good conductor of heat and electricity and subject to the influences that, that they bring. And obviously the last is uh, gold, which is ruled by the sun. It's invulnerable. It is not just resistant, it is not impacted by any single acid. So when you have the light of the sun shining and, and the symbology of what it represents, envy and all of the destructive forces that it, it brings with us are actions that are really, are really overcome by the power of the sun. It also is a basis for our governing authority, financial structure, and the source of power in both physical and spiritual man. The immortal body is a transmuted, not transmitted, spiritual gold. Uh, so what we find is that we are looking to turn lead in the base metals into gold. We're not looking to turn gold into lead. We're looking to perfect ourselves or move toward that perfection based upon the idea of what we can do. So how do you do all this? Well, there is a requirement that we separate the metal from its impurities or it's called referred to as dross. And I'll let you read on, on page 46 about that. But let's turn to some of the agents themselves. What's the process of purifying lead? And physically, this lesson is at all times and without complaining to do the very best one can with what one has. Spiritually, it is that, it is that both poverty and wealth alike uh, in offering opportunity to create values for the soul. Purifying lead is the ability to take what you have and significantly move forward in a positive way rather than being drugged down. Um, you can read on page 53 and it, it talks about the attributes of lead and th the various drudgery and weighting down that it often imposes. There, and I, I like on the, what is it, the one, two, third paragraph, there is a right way to act in sickness quite so much as so as in health. And it is our task to find this way and to apply it. To become disheartened and blue affords no help. It merely assures that we shall be given more of the same laden exercise. Not until we face such conditions with patience, hope, and fortitude have we gained the mastery. Realizing this, we discard the dross and retain the metal in its purest form. So we have the ability to face not denying the reality, like facing COVID right now, not denying the reality of its existence or of its impact, but also saying that this will pass, that I have this and I can draw on the strength to help myself. Now I'm purifying 10 it, on page 54. It's, it really comes down to says it's quite difficult, uh, it's quite as difficult successfully to withstand undue uh, prosperity as it is to contend with adversity. To be sure, prosperity is more pleasing uh, to the physical senses, but it is wrongly viewed if it is equally distressing to our soul. All too early does wealth engender arrogance and pride. All too often, it is taken as a symbol of some inherent superiority. So the, the, the balance and the realization of 10 can be found in understanding that we, we seek that balance that occurs 
with accepting where we are, but also looking to what we can do in helping others. Uh, I, I've, I've been reminded several times uh, because of recent events that it's hard to be self-centered when you're giving to others. It's harder to fall to the temptation of addictions when you're reaching out and your focus is not on yourself, but in, your focus is on someone else. And that's really the theme of the refinement of, of tin. In terms of uh, uh, purifying iron, I have one section here on page 56 and 57 that, that I want to read for you. Uh, being knocked down financially, emotionally, or literally calls for either weeping, calls for neither weeping nor complaint, for, but for as quickly as possible getting on our feet and doing the best we can uh, think of, about it. And so the, the, the uh, ability to overcome the iron that of resistance, to overcome those aspects takes a action and what we'll call directed thinking that we'll learn more about in book nine. And by taking those actions, we can overcome. And there's, there's lots more. One of my favorite really has to do with the purifying of copper. And I'm going to let you, given the time, I'm going to let you read the rest of these in terms of 57, 58 for pur purifying mercury, 59 for purifying uh, both silver and gold. Because there are practical lessons here that you can learn how to separate and how to apply these. Now, the way that we end up doing this is by subjecting the metal and its dross to if you will, a transmutation, a spiritual force. And that really is the often attachment of the emotions to our words. It's one thing to say, I'm going to do X, but it's also then the action of, of entrusting emotional power and attaching that emotional power to those words that brings the heat of transformation. And that's what you're going to find when we talk about tr the, the, the furnace of transmutation and the refractory furnace and of, for lead, for tin, for iron, for copper, for mercury, for silver, and for gold. I've noted the pages on there because frankly, we would spend the rest of our time just trying to even define these. And they are so personal. They are so applicable to situations in our life that sometimes it's easy to get caught up in these things. Now, the one thing that we remember we talked about that reincarnation is that we, we do not practice a belief in reincarnation or what I termed recycling. But what we do practice is the idea of progression. And this higher consciousness section of moving from the chemical to the divine is profound and becomes very personal. And you'll notice that there are all cap words associated with each of these. And I'm, again, I want you to read these for yourself. I want you to be able to incorporate these in fine personal examples. Um, they are not always in the order that they may appear here. Because each of our life's experiences and lessons are progressive, but yet not in the order possibly of someone else. Another family member, a friend, an associate, you may find that your progress to the divine has taken an, a right turn or a left turn, or maybe a circum, a circuitous route, uh, but it is a path that leads and progresses. And I encourage you to take a look at those. So, to honor our time of trying to do 50 minutes, which is extremely hard to do, uh, I, I want to conclude the part that we will have uh, recorded for those of you who are viewing this uh, not in December of 2020, but at a future date so that you can have this preserved. 
So I see that uh, Vega, you've you've been able to to join us. Could you lead us in the closing ceremony? You're muted. I mute myself. Here. There you go. Hi guys, sorry about the uh, confusion there. All right, that was wonderful to see everybody. And we are about to do the Church of Light closing ceremony. If all of you would um, seat yourselves, uh, both feet on the floor, uh, hands in comfort. Eternal brothers and sisters, we are now about to close a Church of Light meeting in the customary manner. And in so doing, let us consider seriously the kind of life it is fitting a brother and a sister of the light should live. We must each leave this meeting to go about our daily duties. But unless we take with us some higher thought and nobler purpose, we have spent our time here in vain. For knowledge lacking goodness leads to naught but self undoing. Each brother and sister has pledged himself or herself to put forth an effort to alleviate physical and mental suffering, to dispel ignorance, and to spread truth. Therefore, even as we would be helped by those of our religion who are more enlightened, let us make every effort to assist others and let each so conduct himself or herself as to be an example of moral purity, radiating light, light and love upon the world of their endeavors. As has been the custom for eons past, let us arise and face the West, wherein at the close of day, the solar orb softly sinks to rest and relinquishes his sovereignty to his heavenly consort. And let us bear in mind that even as the orb of night reflects the glory of the sun, when darkness would shroud the earth, so should each earnest brother and sister reflect the radiance of our teachings, even amidst the darkness of ignorance, lighting somewhat the most obscure, as well as the more luminous paths which they are forced to tread. The Lunar Mother is symbolized in the minds of our ancient brethren as sustaining nature upon whose breast we lean and from whom we draw such experiences as nourish and expand our immortal soul. Let us make the religion of the stars. We stand to indicate active volition with right hand raised to heaven in aspiration to science, wisdom, and power, and the left hand pointing to earth, signifying the desire to reflect the divine will and evincing an unconquerable determination to dominate all acts of life by spirit. You may lower your hand and I will pronounce your benediction. O thou eternal spirit, in whom we live, move, breathe, and have our being. Dismiss us now with thy blessings, and as we travel along our several ways, let ministers of thine guard our footsteps and light our pathways, that we may not stumble in our blindness. From our hearts, we thank those who have assisted in our researches, and now as we depart, we consecrate our efforts to the cause of truth and beneficence. So shall it be. Vega, thank you. Let me halt the recording. Thank you.